All right, everyone. So today we have two presentations. Um, first one is by Mia, who recently joined our city as a senior lecturer. So he's going to talk about uh, pedestrian modeling and uh, PMFD. So we'll hear about that in a minute. And then after that, uh, Frank, should I say Frank? Uh, you are not you, but Frank. Uh, um, which is a uh, student of NIAC, that has traveled all the way from uh, Monash to here, who's going to talk about congestion pricing, and um, that would be in half an hour. So let's start with the debate. Okay, cool. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, as David said, uh, I'm going to talk about pedestrian modeling, but specifically on a recent paper that uh, it's under review at the moment um, on calibrating a social force model, uh, specifically for a bi-directional stream using PMFD. So there are a lot of keywords in the title, and I'll try to introduce each of them. For example, I'll talk about PMFD, I'll talk about social force model, and I specifically talk more about bi-directional uh, streams and why is that important. Um, before uh, going uh, further, I usually like to acknowledge whoever has contributed to the work, usually at the beginning, not at the end. Uh, most of the credit goes to these people. Uh, Neda was a researcher in my group. He, she is a PhD student at Swinburne University in Melbourne, but she worked with me for a couple of months uh, before and at the start of her, her PhD. Uh, she did most of the uh, optimization part of the um, calibration uh, of the model. Uh, Homayun is my PhD student at Monash. Uh, he stayed at Monash, uh, so I'm still a co-external co-supervisor. And Sushmita was an undergraduate uh, who visited us for a couple of weeks from IIT Bombay. So they've done most of the work. I've done a small part of the work. <laughs> So let's start with how do we actually measure pedestrian traffic? I skipped all the introduction why pedestrian traffic is important because I'm sure you all know about it. Uh, but let's get into the science part of it. And that's um, how we measure pedestrian traffic. It's very similar to vehicle traffic, vehicular traffic. Uh, we have flow, we have density, we have a speed as microscopic measures. And this is a an uh, empirical experiment that was done by some of our colleagues in Germany. Uh, some of the videos are online. But let's uh, start, how can we actually measure uh, flow, speed, and density in pedestrian traffic? I said it's very similar to vehicular traffic, but there is a big difference. What's the fundamental difference between pedestrian traffic and car traffic? What's that? There's no lane? And movement is multi-directional. In car traffic, you go in your lane, you go this. Uh, in pedestrian, you go on the X, Y plane. Um, so that's, that's, that makes all the, all the measurement of flow of speed and density a little bit different. There are many different methods to measure some of those uh, uh, characteristics like flow of speed and density. Uh, one easy method is this is a corridor. People are walking in it. You draw a line like a screen line, and then you calculate how you calculate flow. You just count the number of people who pass the line, divided by whatever time window you're looking at, you get the flow. And the speed is just the average of the instantaneous speed of each uh, pedestrian passing through that line. But there's a problem with it. This uh, way of measuring, it's not consistent with uh, traffic flow fundamental identity. Traffic flow fundamental identity is this Q equal KV, the famous uh, identity of traffic flow, which we say flow is equal to density multiplied by speed. When you measure it this way, this equation doesn't hold. So that's a big problem. There's another way of measuring. Instead of uh, considering a screen line, you actually consider two lines, uh, a tiny area with delta x, and the width of the corridor is V and uh, you calculate um, density as the sum of the number of people who pass through this delta x over time and space. And again, 
uh, individual the speed, the speed it would be the average of the instantaneous speed but how do we calculate instantaneous speed you just say everyone who passes in this from this in this area delta x divided by delta t uh, that's our uh, instantaneous speed of uh, pedestrian passing through this uh, tiny delta x area but again there's also a problem here that assumption that everyone travels delta x is not correct uh, if this is a dense area people do not travel necessarily at delta x distance they may go over delta x we've actually shown that when density goes high people start zigzagging that means you travel much longer than whatever the length uh, of that uh, narrow area is so that delta x that tends to underestimate the individual speeds there's another way of doing but still the speed remains the same but density is instead of averaging over time, you just take a snapshot at whatever time interval you want, you just count the number of heads divided by delta x multiplied by v, which is the area, you get the density of that area. But it's still, this is also not consistent with uh, traffic flow fundamental identity. More recently, some of our uh, German colleagues um, proposed a new way of measuring density and flow and speed, and that's for every individual pedestrian you have in an area, you draw a Voronoi diagram around it, and then you do that for the entire area, and then you kind of calculate a local density, which is one over the area of each uh, polygon here. You calculate one over the area of each polygon, that's your local density around each pedestrian. And then if you want to calculate the entire density for whatever width, uh, you just sum all, that, all, all of that one over A, and then you calculate the uh, density. But it's still, this is nice, this is uh, very detailed, much better than the previous one, but still this is also not consistent with traffic flow fundamental identity. It's still, the way you calculate this, you don't get Q equal KV. The only way that you can be consistent with traffic flow fundamental identity is using ED's definition. Have you heard of ED? Who heard of ED? Ah. Have you ever had a traffic flow course? <laughs> so E.D. is a guy from 1960s uh, who said the correct way of measuring traffic is you look at a time and space diagram, which I have time, I have distance, and I have trajectories of whatever object, whether it's vehicles, pedestrian, ants, birds, whatever. Uh, you draw that, you specify a region, and then, flow is sum of all the distances of all of these trajectories within that region. So you just take whatever distance every trajectory has traveled in this area and divide it by the area of this region. That's flow. Density would be the sum of the travel times of these trajectories divided by that area. So sum of the distances, sum of the travel times divided by that area of the region, you get the flow and density. So that's that's the correct way of measuring. But this is, Eddie Edis has done it for vehicular traffic. And you see the X here in this time space diagram, it's one dimensional. Vehicles moving one way. What's that? Always positive. Yes, exactly. Look. Yes. But when it comes to pedestrian traffic, as I said, it's multi-directional. You move on X and Y, not necessarily just on X. So imagine the same corridor. People are red, are moving this way, black are moving this way. And the way we measure, another way of uh, drawing the time and space diagram is draw it in a 3D environment, which we call a 3D time and space diagram which we have z axis as time, and instead of having only x, we have x, y. So you see three dimensional uh, trajectories just passing through each other over time and space, which is nice. And you can have a look at this from the top. If you look at this from the top, you see the trajectories over x and y. This is the area of the <coughs> walk. If you look at it from the side, whatever side, for example, this is y, this is time, you see trajectories passing through each other, right? So that helps us to extend ED's definition from a, a, one di oh, a two-dimensional time and space diagram to a three-dimensional time and space diagram. 
what, an example that I usually uh, make when I talk about pedestrian and its measurements, it's uh, the case with Hajj in Saudi Arabia. How many of you know about Masjid al-Haram or Mecca in Saudi Arabia? Okay, so uh, in Saudi Arabia, there's a city, Mecca. It's a holy city for Muslims, and there is a mosque in it called Masjid al-Haram. Every year, they host two million pilgrims over a week period, one week period. And they all come to this mosque, they circulate around this nice queue seven times. Now imagine we stick a GPS to the pilgrims and we collect their uh, GPS, their, their movements. If we draw that on a 3D time and space diagram, what shape would we be able to see? A spiral shape, right? And that's how it looks like if you look at it from a 3D time and space diagram. Uh, we haven't attached GPS to the pilgrims, but some people in Saudi Arabia has done it. Not all of them, some of it. I mean, we got a very small sample of data. Uh, it wasn't that good, but again, at least it was good for some visualization to uh, teach what a 3D time and space diagram looks like. So if you want to make it general about that 3D time and space diagram, we have this x, y. That's where people walk. That's where people walk. We have time. We have trajectories going all over the place. Instead of having a region A, now we now have a three-dimensional shape. It doesn't have to be a cube. It could be any shape, any irregular shape. But let's stick to a cube because it's easy to work with. I skip some of the details here, but I just go to the way we extend uh, the EDs definitions. So what was the flow in traditional EDs definition? The sum of the distances over the area of that shaded region. Here, it's still the sum of the distances, but over the volume of that shape in a 3D time and space diagram. Same with density. Density would be the sum of the travel times in that shape, in that 3D shape, over the volume of that cube. So if you measure, if you have pedestrian trajectories, the only way you can get Q equal KV, the fundamental identity, it's measuring it this way. So I said all of this to introduce pedestrian macroscopic fundamental diagram. Let me skip some of this and... So now what is pedestrian macroscopic fundamental diagram? Imagine this is the way we're gonna go to measure pedestrian traffic. If I define this Q, in a way that x or y is very tiny, being dy or dx. Imagine this is going to be a very narrow q, not q, uh, similar to q, but very narrow 3D shape, either uh, over x or over y. If I measure the pedestrian uh, traffic flow or density inside that tiny uh, 3D shape, with dx or dy, which is tiny, I get a regular fundamental diagram. I get a regular fundamental diagram. That basically means I'm calculating the fundamental diagram over a tiny stretch uh, over x or over y. Whoever passes this uh, dx or whoever passes that dy, I measure uh, flow and density over it. And if I plot them against each other, I get the regular fundamental diagram. How do I get pedestrian macroscopic fundamental diagram? It's when this x and y are large enough. Imagine. This is my walking area, the cube that I'm trying to measure the pedestrian traffic in it. It's as big as this room. X goes all the way to the boundaries, Y goes all the way to the boundary. So I'm measuring the pedestrian tra uh, flow and density for the entire area, not necessarily over a section. So the more precise terminology that I usually call it area-wide fundamental diagram rather than macroscopic fundamental diagram because the regular fundamental diagram is also macroscopic. We don't call this network fundamental diagram because this is not really a network. So I think the more precise way is area-wide fundamental diagram. So that's PMFD. And how does it look like? So we, we used the same data from the Germany uh, experiment, the German experiment. It's a corridor of eight meter length, 3.6 meter width. The total area is more than 28 square meter. Uh, there are 300 plus pedestrians walking uh, 
uh, in opposite direction. And if you measure the flow and density for the entire corridor, for the entire eight meter length, same, uh, if you do the same thing with the density, that's the PMFP, and that's how it looks like. It is consistent with what we were expecting because we see a hysteresis. I'll talk more about it if I have time. There's a little capacity drop, meaning that when density of pedestrians go over two, we see a drop in the efficiency of how people move around. And same thing with the speed and density. So all of that, what I told you about, is very macroscopic. And that's why it's called microscopic fundamental diagram. Very coarse dynamics. We are not looking at each individual, how they move around. We, we are trying to measure it for the entire walking area. But there are actually more interesting phenomena when you start looking at individuals. For example, have you heard of self-organization? Self-organization is what I guess everyone here has experienced somewhere. Um, maybe in Japan. <laughs> um, imagine a sidewalk. People are walking in opposite directions. There's no lane, there's nothing. No one is forcing anyone, no one is controlling it. But you actually see a self-organization phenomenon forming, self-organized lanes form. You tend to follow the person in front of you, that person tends to follow, and you unintentionally create a lane. It is very unstable. Look at this. It comes at a, this is, I don't have the time here, but it, look at this lane, it's forming, it's growing, and then it just starts dissipating because another lane uh, intersect with it. So this is very interesting. I'm not gonna talk more about this, but I'm gonna use this later to verify my simulation. If in my simulation, I can get the PMFD, good. If I don't get this microscopic phenomenon, that's bad. I wanna, I wanna see self-organized lanes form. So that's PMFD, how do we measure it? That's done. Let's talk about modeling. How much do it? I just have 10 minutes. There are many different ways of modeling. Um, there is gas kinetic or fluid based, there is cellular automata. Uh, it has been done in pit pit of, uh, with car traffic as well. Social forces, the one I'm working with, continuum macroscopic models also exist. Agent based, uh, similar to social force model, but with a different um, philosophy behind it. Area wide or PMFD. That's another way of doing modeling, a very macroscopic way, and network model, which I'm going to work on over the next few years. But what I'm going to show you here is about social force model. So let's see what a social force model is. The original social force model was actually proposed by Dirk Helbing. How many of you know Dirk, Dirk Helbing? Dirk Helbing is a famous physicist. Again, another German physicist. Uh, he and I don't know whether Molnar was his colleague or his student, but they proposed the social force model back in 1995. He's a physicist with a skyrocketing citations, and he does everything. I mean, from traditional quantum physics to pedestrian traffic to car traffic, whatever, ICT, he's, he does everything. So anyways, in 1995, they published a paper in Physical Review E. Last time I checked it uh, when I was Creating these slides, it had more than 3,800 3, 3, citations, that single paper. And it's based, it created a foundation for many different derivatives of social force models later. So what it does, the idea is very simple. Every pedestrian or every agent, when you walk around, there are multiple forces. I want to go from here to that corner. There is a force that drags me to my destination. There are forces from the walls or obstacles against me. If, there is, if I want to go that way and there is a table in front of me, I go this way, as soon as I get close to the table or close enough, there is a force from that table against me, so it pushes me. If you then try to sum those vectors, the force vectors, it pushes me that way and then I keep going. If there are pedestrians around me, they also uh, have a force against each other. So to put it in a mathematical way, a uh, social force model is basically um, a generic differential equation of uh, the rate speed changes. It's a summation of multiple forces. And forces are vectors here. The first term is called desired force. And that's the force that drags me to my destination. 
The second force is called obstacle force, the same thing that I just described. And the last force is the interaction force, where you interact with other people. How, does, how do these forces look like? I quickly go over it. Um, yeah, I don't have time, but let's just quickly see. This is easy. These are forces just uh, is a function of the maximum velocity I want to go. Obstacle force is also a, it's an exponential decay of uh, the distance to an obstacle. And interaction force is a little bit ugly, so many things. But in summary, it's a function of the, the, uh, the distance between myself and another pedestrian and also the difference between our speed not just the magnitude, but the vectors. If I'm very close to another one, if our ve speed vectors are parallel, you're not uh, forcing each other to move around. But if I'm far away and our speed vectors are pointing to each other with another pedestrian, that means I have to move around because uh, we're gonna collide. There's another force that we would like to act to it, and that's a psychological force or looking at force. We don't wait until we hit another pedestrian to uh, do, a, do a lateral movement. We start uh, changing our direction when we are a little bit, uh, when we have a little bit of distance from the other pedestrian. So that's called look ahead force. Let's move, move, move that. So, five minutes. So that's, that's the modeling framework, okay? So you know what, how to measure pedestrian traffic, you know what PMFT is, I told you what a social force model is, and now why do we need to calibrate it? Of course, like any other simulation model, there are parameters, and if you don't, parameter, and if you don't, if you don't calibrate those parameters, we may end up simulating maybe walking behavior in Mars, not on Earth. Um, Social force model has been calibrated before a lot of times, mostly for unidirectional movements. They had some empirical data of people going in one direction. They've calibrated the parameters for that movement. But it hasn't been calibrated for a bidirectional movement. And that's bidirectional is actually more interesting because that's what the, the interesting phenomena happens, like a self-organization. Uh, and of course, if you apply the same parameters, it's not going to work. Let me skip this. Um, so some of the research questions that we tried to answer in this research was, can we actually calibrate a very microscopic model like social force model based on PMFT, which is very coarse dynamics? And if we do that, can we reproduce the microscopic behavior like this uh, self-organization phenomena? So here's our social force model. We have all the forces, uh, a desired obstacle, uh, interaction or physical, and look ahead force. We have uh, different weight factors uh, behind them in addition to the parameters of the model. So the way we calibrate it, it's very uh, common uh, in any other simulation model. We want to minimize the error. The error is the error related to density measurements plus the error related to flow measurements. But the way we measure those flow and density is from the extended EDs definitions consistent with the PMFD that we want to measure flow and density for the entire walking area, not just a section. And that's just a normalized error, a simulation minus empirical data. We want to minimize the error between simulated density and the observed density. Neda, the, our, my research assistant, knew how to do genetic algorithm. She's done something in her master's. I'm not a fan of genetic algorithm, and I don't know much about it. So I said, okay, whatever. I don't care what solution algorithm we use. You know how to do it with GA, go with GA. So she implemented the GA. It's basically a simulation-based optimization. I see lights in David's eye shining. <laughs> um, we basically run the simulation. We do the measurements of flow and density. We see how the error is. If it's bad, we go back. We keep doing this until we converge to whatever the, maybe not converging, whatever the stop criteria is, we meet that stopping criteria. So here's the experimental data we get from Germany. Let me show you some of the interesting videos of the empirical data and the simulations. So these two are from empirical data, different data sets, and these are what the simulation gives me after we calibrate. It's not, of course, we're not gonna expect everything moves the same, it's not gonna happen, but what I was interested in, uh, we're gonna see some differences which I'm gonna talk about. In a real world, it's very, it's more homogeneous. In my simulation, we see 
uh, clusters forming. Uh, they're not as nicely distributed in the simulation. But we see some lanes forming. For example, you see, you, you, see, you start seeing lanes forming, like a bunch of red or blue dots uh, moving together as a group, which was nice, and that's what we wanted to see. So this is the, I skipped some of the details of it, but let me show you the final calibration results. That's the final calibration results. This is the PMFD. Black is the empirical data. Uh, red is the simulation averaged over five different runs. Uh, and we see the PMFD looks very consistent with what we see in reality, but with a larger hysteresis. And this larger hysteresis kind of explains why we had uh, less homogeneous people in the area. When you have heterogeneous or inhomogeneous uh, distribution of people in an area, you get a large hysteresis, but let's skip those details. Um, here is the speed uh, map or speed color maps. This is empirical data. This is the final calibration results, and these are the validation. And you can still see what is what are the colors minus uh, uh, one something, which is the 1.5 was the maximum density. So blue means uh, going one direction, red means going the other direction. That's why plus one negative speed uh, means going in one direction and uh, positive speed means the other direction. So look at here, we see some people going that direction, a group of pedestrians going this way and a group of pedestrians going this way. This is coming from simulation. And that's exactly what we wanted to see, a self-organized lane forming. Although we didn't care about, we didn't force that self-organization. We only looked at PNFD, and we only tried to match PNFD. But we, the, the, the self-organization automatically emerges out of it. Uh, that's another verification. And that's, this is the, the calibration itself that you see. This is one lane for me, which is inter which is one. This is over the entire time of simulation. So another lane is also going this way, the blue uh, movement direction. They intersect, uh, and that's what it caused some instability in um, the uh, lanes. Um, so I'm going to skip some of the verification things, and I'll just go to the last slide, which is what did we learn? Uh, obviously, we knew and we learned that if you apply the parameters that comes from a unidirectional stream uh, to a pedestrian model, and if you apply it to a bidirectional stream, it's bad. You're not going to get uh, the good results that you're expecting to get out of simulation. We also learned that in social force model, we kind of need to constrain the lateral and backward movements. Uh, let's uh, skip some of the details of it. I didn't talk much about it in my slides. And what is nice here is, although, as I said, although we calibrated based on PMFT, but we managed to, to get self-organization out of it, but still, that doesn't guarantee. Maybe we were lucky. Maybe our setup was somehow that we could get self-organization. Although we say we can get it, but still there's no guarantee. That means if you do calibrate based on PMFT, you still have to go back and check whether you see self-organization. And uh, the nice thing was we saw PMFT out of the simulation as well with hysteresis, which is a nice characteristic of uh, PMFT. And that's it. Uh, 33 minutes. Yeah. Sorry if I went too fast. Uh, you can ask questions later or anytime you like. Yeah. Just one or two questions. Let me see if anyone's. Not by chance, it's called emergence. Um, what does emergence mean? Emergence means uh, imagine an agent-based simulation. You, you define specific rules for each agent. Um, 
imagine this room, every one of us, I give you whatever rule. And then when we want to play together, although everyone is following their individual single rule, but after you run it for a certain time, you, still, you start seeing some emergent phenomena, a collective phenomena coming out of it, like a pattern. A very, uh, maybe clear example, very unrelated to transport is segregation in urban areas, uh, either racial segregation or income segregation. Why racial segregation happens in our cities that people live like a certain ethnic, ethnicity in, in the US, for example, white and black. Why this happens? If no one's forcing, no one's guiding anyone, if everyone in the society wants to live out of 10 people, out of the 10 neighbors, I wanna have five neighbors with my ethnicity, if everyone follows that rule, and if you let the society does that over time, you start seeing society will segregate. Uh, although no one is forcing that segregation. So same thing here. Everyone wants to go to the desired destination. There's some forces and then that self-organization emerge. Sure. Why do we need control to grow speed density relationship? You know that first thing. Right, right, right. Why do we try, why does the mother need to have that? Because we want to make sure our simulation matches reality. Yes, yeah, so there is empirical evidence that yeah, 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 yeah. So what we do is we try to match. So in like any other simulation, you want to match one measurement out of the simulation to match reality. For example, in DTA, yeah, yeah, yeah. you want to match link flows. I'm talking more really about the beginning of the simulation where you said that besides these models, yeah, no, no yeah. model would verify that relationship. Q equal KV. Oh, Q equal a KV yeah. is very different than the traffic flow fundamental diagram. You can have a traffic flow fundamental diagram, but then Q may not be equal to KV if you do the multiplication. So because that's the correct way of doing the measurements. So if you, why? Because that's the correct way. If you imagine this, whatever other method you used for measuring flow and density, that's not correct. How, how incorrect, how much incorrect they are, that's another question. But I would say they are incorrect. Especially when it comes to, if you want to do some, for whatever application, you want to do mathematical derivation, many studies assume Q is, Q is equal to KV, and then they do their math. Right. But if their actual measurements is not consistent with Q equal KV, then that's wrong. So it's better to have everything consistent at the beginning, Q equal KV, and then we're sure that all our measurements are consistent, and then whatever you want to do afterwards, uh, will be correct. Yes. Could you use a simple method to estimate the density of the flow? Yeah. And then you would define the Q equal to be as a Q equation for yeah. the density, you know, as a extra parameter or like something that can, the Q equal to. Yeah, you can do that. If it exists. Then, then it wouldn't be Q equal KV, it would be Q equal KV multiply correction factor. Yeah. yeah, you can do that, but that's not the correct way of doing it. <laughs> uh, it's like saying F equal MG, but that's not really like the force of when you want to do a sky fall, um, a free, free fall. To be honest, in practice, no matter how you measure Q and density and speed, even in vehicular traffic, people still assume Q, Q equal KV, although it wouldn't uh, hold. Imagine if you get the Q and speed and density out of your loop detector in a vehicular traffic, Q equal is not, Q won't be equal to KV there because the measurements from loop detector is not consistent with EV's definitions. But still, we sometimes assume it's equal and we just deal with the error we get or we deal with the propagation of error in our models. We, we say it's okay. Yes, exactly, exactly. 
Iya. 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 Correct. That's correct. For it's 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 worse for pedestrian traffic. Yeah. But even in car traffic, if it's not that homogeneous, if there's a lot of a stop and go, uh, if you do collect data from loop detectors, and then if you do Q equal KV and you see they don't match, if you calculate, if you get your Q from loop detectors, and if you get the K and V and then try to match them, you see they won't match. But yeah. I mean, I mean, like, the copy a little bit like stochasticity about like, just simulation. There is a stochasticity. It, every time you do simulation, you, you get different uh, outcome. Yeah, I know, but I mean, for example, when you have a meter on the like, I have like different forces, so I move. But maybe the, the direction will not be the deterministic direction you made. The stochasticity that we implemented in was. Uh, the maximum speed that everyone wants to have was not fixed. It was a normal distribution around a fixed mean. Okay. So the mean of the desired speed is 1.5, let's say, but I may choose 1.4, you may choose 1.6. Yeah. So that stochasticity okay. creates heterogeneity in how, fa how fast I want to go. And I, I mean, actually, you, you, can, I mean, you, you can even incorporate it without directions. Because you see the empirical data and the simulation data, so they're different. So there's more homogeneous flows in the empirical data. When you add stochasticity yeah. in directions, probably you may have a, a better results in this. Um, I don't agree that necessarily flow is more. No, but this is flow. The black is the empirical one. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying this one. I mean, the, the single, uh, like the, the oh, uh, from visually, you can't really say. No, it's not a good idea to visually get yeah. an impression of how flow fluctuates. Uh, you have to look at the measurements. Yeah, yeah, and when you look at the actual measurements, you see flow uh, fluctuates a lot as well. Yes, oh, yeah. that's correct. That's one of the limitations of our simulation so far. That's what I also said. That that's why we get a larger hysteresis. If this is the empirical, this is this is the actual data, yeah. empirical data, and this is our simulation. We can see that we see a, a, an, an empty area in our simulation, while in reality, uh, it's not really. There is no real yeah. empty. Uh, what I mean is like what we have is more like stochasticity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. now I get what your point. Yeah. Yes, yeah. maybe, maybe if you yeah, add yeah. more stochasticity, yeah. people yeah. would. Uh, Occupy the space more homogeneously. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's a good idea, actually.